November 23, 1902, The Sunday Vindicator, Youngstown, Ohio. Mrs. Catherine Tingley, the Purple Mother of Theosophy. Webster's Dictionary defines theosophy as any system of philosophy or mysticism which proposes to attain intercourse with God and superior spirits and consequent superhuman knowledge by physical processes, as by the theurgic operations of some ancient Platonists or by the chemical processes of the German fire philosophers, also a direct, as distinguished from a revealed, knowledge of God supposed to be attained by extraordinary illumination, especially a direct insight into the processes of the divine mind and the interior relations of the divine nature. Broadly, then, that is what Catherine Tingley, the High Priestess, the Purple Mother of Theosophy, may be assumed to stand for. By inference, that is also what her followers are thought to stand for. And that this woman of marvelous mentality and a magnetism which those who know her best declare is phenomenal, as thousands upon thousands of followers in this country cannot be denied. The personality, especially when it is a feminine one, which can so dominate a large number of persons of both sexes, is necessarily an interesting study. In order, however, to understandingly consider Mrs. Tingley, it is necessary to go back some years to the practical inauguration of the Theosophical cult in the United States. It has generally been assumed that Madame Volotsky, a Russian woman of massive proportions, was the founder of the Theosophical Society in the United States, which she always declared was but a Western branch. According to her, Theosophy is as old as the hills in India. She only introduced it to the ignorant West. According to Henry J. Newton of New York, however, one of the organizers of the Theosophical Society, at whose house the initial meeting of those interested was held, there was no thought at the time of any East Indian association. He declares that the phase was engrafted only after Madame Blavatsky and William Q. Judge, the former at the time, the spiritual head, and the latter, the president of the society, had made a trip to the East Indies. Mr. Newton was not a warm supporter of the Blavatsky pretension, and it appears to be his opinion that the lady had shrouded theosophy and a veil of Orientalism for no other purpose than to impress her followers and attract converts. Mr. Newton certainly makes out a good circumstantial case, for he produces the original draft of the oath of the Theosophists signed at his house. The name H. P. Blavatsky appears thereon in a firm, bold hand immediately below the topmost one, that of H. P. Olcott, who was later to become a thorn in the side of the Blavatsky wing of the cult when dissensions threatened the very existence of the body. Mr. Newton's name follows a blank space after Blavatsky's. This was left, Mr. Newton declares, for the signature of Mrs. Newton, but that lady refused to sign, and the space was never filled. However other facts may be, it seems to have been established beyond possibility of contradiction that the Theosophical Society had its inception at the time mentioned by Mr. Newton in the summer of 1875, at the suggestion of Henry M. Stevens, at that time an editorial writer on the New York Mail and Express. In a very short time, Madame Blavatsky, through the wonderful personal magnetism which was the admiration of her friends and the despair of her enemies, had become the recognized authority on theosophy. Her lieutenant was William Q. Judge, a man of much ability. But the affairs of the organization languished, and in 1879, Mr. Judge and Madame Blavatsky made their famous trip to the East Indies, Upon their return, there was renewed interest in the society, which began to grow at a rapid rate. Madame Blavatsky died in 1891, and Mr. Judge, who had been named by her, succeeded her as the supreme head of the body. In 1895, Mr. Judge died. He had previously met Mrs. Tingley and, in his writings, found after his death, she was so unmistakably pointed out as the proper person to succeed him that she was chosen. It was feared at the time of Mr. Judge's death that the organization would disintegrate, for it was generally recognized that he was a remarkable organizer and that much of whatever success had been won was due to his ability and untiring efforts. But there never was a greater mistake. If Mr. Judge was a good organizer, Mrs. Tingley is a wonderful one. The society, 
the name of which had been changed by the new leader to the Society of Universal Brotherhood, grew at an unprecedentedly rapid rate. And when Mrs. Tingley and several chosen spirits made their tour of the world, they succeeded in winning tens of thousands of converts and establishing branches in nearly every civilized country of the world. And who is this woman who has succeeded marvelously where conceitedly able persons have succeeded only measurably? What is the secret of her remarkable power over persons of more than ordinary intelligence? Persons who, even though you disagree with them, must be admitted to be deep thinkers. It would be interesting to analyze the character and mental equipment of this woman and seek to learn there from the secret of her preeminence among her people. But there are at hand no facts upon which to base such an analysis. Her life reads like the life of an ordinary woman of ordinary ability. There is nothing in her career to cause the uninitiated to suspect the possession of traits of character of a higher or finer quality than those with which one is confronted every day in his usual circle of acquaintances. The records do not appear to agree as to the date of the birth of the present leader of the Society of Universal Brotherhood, but she was probably born about 55 years ago. At any rate, the scene of her birth is Newburyport, Massachusetts, and it is pretty well established, too, that her father was one Westcott, the keeper of a saloon and hotel. It is not overstating the fact to say that Mr. Westcott was not the most admired man in Newburyport. Little Catherine seemed to be much as other girls in those days, and is said to have been as fond of the harmless, though sometimes rather rough, pleasures of childhood as she is now fond of theosophy. In time, she found her way to New Orleans, where she married a compositor named Cook, it has often been stated that Mrs. Tingley's daughter, Flossie, who has, at various times, occupied much newspaper space, was the result of this union, but those close to Mrs. Tingley declare that Flossie was merely an adopted child. At any rate, Mr. and Mrs. Cook separated, and the latter was married to George W. Parent, a detective who, afterward, became a saloon keeper. During the time she was Mrs. Parent, the present Purple Mother adopted two boys, the parents finally agreed to disagree, and the female member of the firm, after some years in Boston, went to New York, where she found it exceedingly difficult to make both ends meet. Eventually, she attracted the attention of Professor Paul McCarthy and studied hypnotism under his direction. The professor was of the opinion that she possessed marvelous psychic gifts, but somehow or other hypnotism alone did not suffice for a living, and she was next engaged in the exploitation of an invalid's chair. Many of the lady's acquaintances are said to have put money into the venture, but eventually it was abandoned. Mrs. Parent at about this time met Philo P. Tingley, a clerk in a New York commercial house. After a brief courtship, they were married. Mrs. Tingley had in her spare moments been devoting her attention to spiritualism and had acquired some reputation. By natural and easy stages, she drifted into the study of theosophy, but was nothing more than a simple follower until after her meeting with W.Q. Judge, Madame Blavatsky's successor, as the head of the Theosophical Society. Mr. Judge was greatly impressed with Mrs. Tingley's powers as a hypnotist, and the new pupil progressed rapidly, so that when Mr. Judge died, it was no surprise when it was found that Mrs. Tingley had been unmistakably designated as his successor. Mrs. Tingley has repeatedly denied through her intimates that she has ever claimed to be the reincarnation of Madame Blavatsky, and it is also not true that she imitates the poses of the Russian woman. The school at Point Loma near San Diego, California, has long been one of Mrs. Tingley's pet projects. The site was selected, it is claimed, before she had ever seen the place, a vision having been the means through which she arrived at the conclusion that it was the proper spot for the erection of a school, which was to eclipse all other institutions of learning in the world. The recent compulsory return to Cuba of the children who had come here to enter the Point Loma Foundation brought the institution into general notice. It also served to direct attention to Spot, a very ordinary spaniel dog, in which or whom it is averred the soul of the late W.Q. judge at present abides. This quadrupedal reincarnation according to the best authorities, is treated with a consideration approaching reverence by everyone connected with the Point Loma Institution and, by the way, it is said that the buildings and grounds at Point Loma 
already represent an investment of more than $500,000, with much yet to be done. Intuition, at the present time, appears to be the strong card of the Society of Universal Brotherhood. Through it, and its sister introspection, it is claimed that much may be accomplished, which to the ordinary benighted and unsophisticated individual would appear impossible. But through it all, and despite the denunciation of her Society of Universal Brotherhood by Mrs. Annie Besant's Theosophical Society, Mrs. Tingley reigns supreme. Her decisions upon all points at issue are final, and when, as occasionally happens, there arises some local leader with the temerity to dispute her authority and allege that she is not conducting the affairs of the society for the best interests of its members, something is certain to happen quickly, and that something is usually the resignation of the recalcitrant leader. James Wilson Bruce